moving on to factor marketing interventions. So there's three categories under this, performance requirements, restriction rate FDI, and playing a role in the capital market and financial sectors. Part of the performance requirements are to improve the social outcomes, contribute to macroeconomic balance, strengthen domestic capacity, and aid with forward and backward linkages. You can read up what forward and backward linkages are. So that's kind of idea between the informal sector and the formal sector and the relationships between them. Where maybe the informal sector is a supplier to the formal sector or the formal sector is a supplier to the informal sector. Could read up on formal and backward linkages. Um, in terms of the restriction of FDI, it's just the whole idea is looking at it's no use to have a lot of money coming into your country that is taking ownership of what your country is. So, so stuff of that is important to look at. In the capital and financial market, it's all about trying to correct the financial market imperfections, trying to aid with infant industries, and then looking at protecting or phasing out declining industries. Let's talk about what happened in East, East Asia. So at the beginning of what East Asia was about, is they were import substitution orientated. So what they wanted to do was replace all the imports and try to produce stuff locally. And then they found out a uh, time through influences like internal factors like are the markets, are the sizes of the markets, the types of shocks they were facing, and how import substitution wasn't really working for them. The strategies wasn't really working. What they found was they were still importing certain goods, or they weren't really becoming competitive. And they were finding that applying input substitution that there was the attraction of getting foreign investment was a problem and that other external factors there was still a lot of competition going around so they couldn't compete um, they weren't able to compete with technology change and also with the world pressures through GATT and the, the multilaterals from the world trade organization so those are factors that were getting they were facing and then you decided, hey, let's take this a different way. Let's move from input substitution to export orientation. So that is now where you're trying to promote your exporting of goods. You're not trying to replace your imports with domestic products. You're just trying now to grow by ensuring that you're able to export to multiple countries and that. So they thought the way they can do this and improve on the export was to develop a knowledge and a structural base. So as we know, that pushed a lot into education, Anna. And in today's time, we know Asian people as one of the smartest technological um, minds. So if you look at it, the things that we're facing also at that time was rapid globalization. Everything was changing. The way everything was connecting towards each other changed. How things were transported communications you know in the 90s and that um prior to that the internet was there but the 90s was the time when the really um communications were improving through the internet and that and at some stage so all these changes was happening globalization and the comparative advantage was changing so this is all ideas of them thinking about huh we need to change in the way we do things or so so all these changes happening in the global market, they thought, we need to decentralize the production, meaning we're not going to produce from only one Asian country. So if you look at um, China, so they're thinking, ah, let's form a partnership with another country here, and another country here, and another country here. Not everything is going to produce from one thing. So in our cases, in, in, if you think Asian, you're thinking Japan, you're thinking Korea, you're thinking in the neighboring countries and, and stuff like that, like South Korea. So in South Korea and these countries, what they decided to do is, okay, I do this. I source this product from someone else. You produce that product. We produce this product in this little a neighboring country. And then another neighboring country helps out with the other thing. If we don't do these type of things, it's technology. We find our resources maybe from Africa or something like that. So all these things were changing. Components and parts were outsourced. So this is our idea I was talking about. You find parts in it from a different place, certain components. And the way technology was moving, 
was the restructuring what was happening in terms of the industries and that. As we know, in Asia, this is probably where the greatest change in technology occurs, where the more and more fast improvements is. China is more the country that is good at cloning technology and there is a rule for that and we will discuss later. So they found that by jumping on the bull wagon with technology change and by improving their local education and making them more smarter to handle this technology change, they were able to compete against the decrease in competitiveness. Because there's a lot of people out there trading and that the new rules are coming out that everybody needs to drop the import tax. Everybody needs or import tariffs. Everybody needs to address what they're doing in terms of export tariffs and that. So they're addressing all these issues and that. And now there's a lot more countries because of this drop of tariffs and that that are now competing with each other because prices are kind of changing. We are no longer ensuring our other countries' prices are high by imposing tariffs on them. So you're creating competition in it. And this was helping. And this was uh, the causes of what was changing in terms of Asia. And that. So they decided, okay, we need to gain some competitive advantage. And this idea was the whole is jump on this technological and uh, technological technology technological change. Sorry, the technological change they were jumping onto. And then through the system where we have countries working with each other, neighboring countries, and we do a value added production, which means I, if we look in terms of cars, I specialize in building the shell of the car. Um, the country next door specializes on doing the rims of the car. I send it to you, you put the windows and all these funny things. So they were doing that, but just within the region, just within Asia. You find these type of value added productions all across the world. You find South Africa's is assembly point, so they might not produce all the parts in that. So other countries produce the parts to ship it down here. They make use of our cheaper labor. And maybe we have the space to to hold all these parts and and put it in, in in that, and put it together in that sense. So these are the things that we were facing, and Asia tried to jump on the bandwagon. And uh, for me, from my side, do you really need to know this? No, you just need to probably know that um, sometimes there are circumstances that pushes the country to change their policy. Um, or the type of um, trade policy or industrial policy that are applying um, to something that is more competitive than that. So yeah, you, you see a lot of time they talk about um, comparative advantage yeah, and they're referring here yeah, in essence um, to to Ricardian's um, philosophy and that. So that is a lot of what I was talking about. I'm talking about a country who's going to specialize in one group. When we talk about um, comparative advantage, we are the best at producing this thing, so we producing producing entirely. But they're not talking about the whole idea that is this this is the only good we're producing. This is they're just talking in terms of export imports. So this may be the only export they're producing or type of export they're producing. So the first thing was to address the Asian markets or to address the domestic market competition. So I allowed imports to come and influence productivity so then okay they open the borders and it's like okay we no longer gonna have the problem where we're gonna impose the import tariff and make the the overseas product more expensive we say let's bring them in let's see how this competition directly enforces how how this product directly enforces the price of our local market so they did that and at the same time, this forced them to try newer technologies and newer techniques. So it would then give them that advantage they would get over their competitors. So no more you're relying on, oh no, government's helping us and protecting us. We can't, we need to find ways to be better than, our, than the other markets in that. So they also then establish international networks to help them with getting in foreign direct investment. And they also looked at, see, it wasn't just, okay, let's affect the markets. And that government got involved and they also now designed a um, macroeconomic policy that would help them through the processes and that. And at the same time, they ensured there was good infrastructure built. So it's not, okay, we're going to do all these type of things. We want to get a better product and that. And then we're not addressing the infrastructure side and that. And that's the whole thing about Africa. We'll find 
this infrastructure is very, very lacking. But yet they have all these big aspirations. But they're not addressing the issues of, oh, do we have enough factories out there that can produce what we want to do we competitively? They want to be competitive, but they can never produce a certain amount. They do not have the knowledge to produce a certain amount in that. So these are things that you need to look at in that. So that was the other issues also they did. As, as I said before, they looked at education and they also concentrated on some research and development to ensure that they're always getting the latest technology. Everything is stemming from them, it's not coming from other place. It's okay, you can copy what they do, like China does. They copy what the newest technology is, they clone it. But it's, yeah, that's more for mass produce and a bit later for market, but then it's cheaper in that sense. So they, that's what China's thing is kind of about. And obviously they cheap labor to a degree. While, as you find from Aguna, they're always offering the best thing, the newest thing coming out of the market. And, and for a lot, they can capture the market, right? So you're not late to the market, you're always new to the market in that sense. So we're going to look at a little rules and that. Um, it's important to know some of this stuff. They can be asked in terms of definitions and that. So, you know, these multilateral rules that the World Trade Organization looked at. The first thing was addressing tariffs, anti-dumping, and safeguards. Um, so a tariff reduction program just means, in general, every country had to look at how it was going to reduce its tariffs to its neighboring countries. Or any other country to was trading with. So that was the first thing. If you join this organization, you need to effectively start dropping your tariff rates. Not to zero immediately, it's a process. So you're not forcing that. Then there's the other idea of a buying tariff. Um, so that is saying you're going to enter in a relationship with another country, but you cannot ask more or you're not going to charge them higher than a certain tariff. So it's a maximum tariff. That is what a buying tariff is saying. If you go and charge them anything more than this buying tariff, any more than this maximum, then you have to find some way to compensate them. So a lot of people have these buying tariffs in sensitive things, where they felt, yeah, we can't drop our tariffs entirely over time. We need to keep the tariffs this rate, because this is a market we think we, we can still grow in and we still can be competitive in. So this is where they had their buying tariffs in. And then is the anti-dumping rules. So what and the safeguard measures that was put in place. Safeguard just means is how do we retaliate against someone who is not getting to the rules? What is the retaliation in that sense? So if you break the rules, what are the rules on that or the steps we have in place that we're gonna now tackle the issue that has come forth? Anti-dumping is this idea that another country comes into your market, drops a good or very very cheap on the market like ridiculously cheap that it's impossible to be, to be competitive even if they're making a loss so they do this drop it very cheap in the market everybody moves away from all other products that are similar and jumps onto this market that's now very very cheap so then it entirely makes all the other companies go bankrupt they can't compete and now this is the only market only good on the market now what happens is this is the only company now producing this type of good and now they can change prices how they want to but the whole idea is dropping a market, uh, a good onto a market so cheaply that no one can compete with the product. And it's most likely going to land up in uh, all those other companies going bankrupt and this one country being established. Then we move on to the second thing, export promotion subsidies. So they were just looking at how do we prevent people from, from governments to aid so it's more so it's easier to see when an import tariff is put on a good. So it is not easier to see when government is uh, putting subsidies or helping um, a country export a good. So they can jump in the process and make labor cheaper by saying, oh, we're going to pay 20% of, of your labor. Or they say, we're going to pay for your tariffs. Not tariffs, I mean for your factors production. Or we're going to give you land and all these funny things. And that. So, uh, so government can come at various processes in. They can make taxes as cheap as possible for the companies, the local domestic companies. So these things need to be put in place and to ensure that government can't step in. So there was rules for export promotion in that sense. So export promotion and subsidies in the sense. And then they came up with this thing called the subsidies and countervailing measures. It's like, what are these rules that we need to have in place that people need to abide to 
that is part of the multilateral rules. And essentially what they said is, for any country that has less than a thousand per capita, um, we would allow them a bit more slack in terms of following the subsidy rules. So we said, okay, you have less than a thousand per capita per person, we'll still allow you to apply subsidies onto your export amount. As I said here, the third fact, constraints are weak and production subsidies are weak, meaning it's a bit more difficult to track what is happening in terms of subsidies and that. I'm not saying it's impossible, but they can do that. And then there's two definitions, trims and trips. These are two of the regulations that people follow. Trims is trade-related investment measures. I like asking this as a simple question, but since I told you definitions might be, of course, you can copy and paste for your exam. It might not appear. So trims is, got really, is related to the actual product, um, how you preventing this product on your market or putting a restriction against this market. So usually speaking, for any product in any country, they would give preference to the local, mar the local market, the local products. So what you're trying to say now is with trims, okay, let's allow for there to be some remove. So let's allow for the, the foreign market or the foreign goods to be able to compete with the domestic uh, with the domestic products. So you're not putting in any rules or regulations that makes it more difficult for the foreign firms to sell their product locally. You're giving equal competition to the domestic market and to the foreign goods. So domestic products and foreign products equal competing. Because what some countries do is they say, okay, you can bring your product, uh, your foreign product in, but 40% of that production must occur within our country. So you come and sell it to us, but we want to be in, involved in some of the process, trying to ensure that some content of that is the foreign market. Then we have TRIPS. TRIPS is related to intellectual properties and just trying to prevent imitation. That's the whole thing. We don't want people to come and copy on that, so you, we're providing some copyrights on that. That is the key thing for this. We want to establish copyrights that would copy work. So you need to be innovative in the way you, you tackle um, your, your, your markets and that. How you aid your firms and that. So not allowing firms just to simply copy somebody else's technology and that. So you need to attract some form of um, foreign direct investment to help aid and do have some research and development policies in place to help you with the technology side so that you're not copying any of these work. And then we have GATS. GATS is a general agreement on trade in services. The whole idea there was just to remove barriers to trade. But they didn't stipulate which markets you, or which uh, industries you need to do this in. They just said you have to remove it. So what some countries did is they looked at the industries they weren't competitive in, then they started removing their barriers to trade there and slowly tried to keep the comparative advantage with tariffs in other sectors. And then there's something about infant industry protection. And for now, this will be covered in another lecture. So they were just looking at their stages. Usually the infant industry protection, they allow this more for those firms um, who we could argue that we can really be competitive in here and we actually need it to have some ad advantage or some or struggling countries in a sense and they needed this infant industry protection for the time being otherwise they their whole economy would be very slacking or couldn't compete with the recent world and generally would mean that the economy would crash and, and then there was another thing um special differential treatment and um special differential treatment is just looking at developing countries, allowing them to slack on some of the rules in there. And for all the rules we discussed about trims, uh, trips, all these funny things is um, they could allow the special treatment for, 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 for all the other rules. They could be allowed, okay, you can slack here. To, or not all the rules apply for you for a short period of time. It's not indefinite. It would be, okay, we can do this for a short while if we get to the stage. Okay, we're going to relax the rules on that.
So what implications do these World Trade Organization rules have for industrial policy? So firstly, they never these rules were not targeted if you for balance of payments ideas. So I wasn't looking at hey, is my imports balancing with my exports? Is my foreign trade investment helping balance all these components? And I wasn't looking at accounting type of approach. The whole idea is was looking at hey, is my trade being as fair as possible? Regardless of how many exports or imports I was actually selling. So those are the things I looked at. I looked at only merely at the regulations of your exports and imports and not at looking at how many exports and imports you were really producing or how many exports and imports your country, your country was experiencing and, that, and whether this was ultimately leading to your best growth in that from a counting type of perspective. It wasn't also addressing how is your policy instru inst instruments affecting your trade effects, your trade policy in a sense. So I wasn't looking at any trade effects or policy instruments used by foreign firms. So it's looking at your form, your country alone. So here's your country alone. Okay, you need to address this rule and that rule so that you allow for more equal competition type of thing. But it was not really looking at, hey, this country's policy that they're using for their local firms, how is that ultimately affecting my country? It's nothing to do with that type of thing. And everything they looked at was more generic. They were not looking at, hey, countries are very different in their makeups. They're not exactly the same. There's not one type of approach that we're going to apply to everything else. Unfortunately, they didn't address that countries are unique. So try to look at it from, okay, it takes whatever general rule they could find earlier on. And in earlier on, a lot of the influence from these trade agreements and these trade policy adjustments and that were from developed countries. So developed countries, what would apply for them in that generation, 10, 20 years, could be now have come generic in a sense. And now they say, okay, we're implying this flat out even now for these developing countries, which are finally entering into the market. In, in a sense. So we're applying rules that might not be fair now on the generation is trying to be competitive, which was not really in the market maybe 30, 40 years ago because of um, colonialism. So there's these type of things that you need to look at. Anna. And then lastly, as I mentioned earlier, anything with these special uh, rules that was put in place, these are only transitional. So over time, the things need to be dropped. So TPOs is not something I'm going to be dealing with you. It's something separate you would have done in the readings. You can go read on trade uh, promotion organizations. Um, I, it's possible for me to ask you a short question, but I won't. So take my word, you don't need to read trade pro promotion organizations. This is just like creating some type of organization that will help you trade in it. And the things you need to look at is from a commercial side, a marketing side, a services side, um, from group promotion side, looking at shipping and transport, um, export training, export licenses, it takes all these things into place too. So it's an organization designed purely to help you with your trade in that. It does exist in that. Um, so this is a generalization from all, all those trade promotion organizations. Skipping through everything. And then finally to duty drawbacks and temporary admissions. Right? So this is looking at the idea is a lot of the time we find a product that we bring and we sell the input for those goods. When we we might not we might not um, have the input for the goods that we're producing. So we ship this imports from overseas in, and then unfortunately we get tariffs on this imports and that there's no there's very few places in the world where they don't have an import tariff All right so that is the problem that faces so we have a locally produced company that produces cars but to produce cars we need metal 
So you, we don't uh, really produce metal in South Africa, so we ship this metal in from where? From say we where metal come from. So let's say America. In this case, we ship in the metal. Unfortunately, we have an import tariff in place, so we. So that metal that we're shipping is now going to become more expensive because of the import tariff um, thing in place. Ultimately, what that means for our cars that we sell across the world, the price is going to increase because our imports are, uh, our, Im our import tariffs is making our imports are expensive in that sense. So now this place measures in place to try to remove this import tariffs. And the first way is a duty drawback. So we have a duty drawback and a um, imports here, another word here, intermediate goods. So this is what we're looking at. Don't really worry about the other type of protectionism. I'm merely looking at the protectionism in terms of the med intermediate goods um, imports. So this is the duty drawbacks and temporary admission. You see, you can look at protection that leads to domestic no sales. That is, when you make trying to promote your own good, you're making all foreign goods very expensive. And you can look at protectionism on exchange rates. And that is now looking at how your imports affect your balance of payments. So how you control that to keep your your currency your, at a certain exchange rate amount. So this is not what I'm looking at. I'm more concentrating on protectionism on intermediate goods. So duty drawbacks. So this is just saying any duty or any import tax that you pay on this in input good or intermediate good you are getting this pay back to you that is it as simple as that you have all your money is getting paid back to you at some point so the problem with this is all the administration that is designed to get this good pay back to you is costly and becomes very more very difficult especially when input tariffs are about 15 percent and 20 percent it also occurs the process that not all these input tariffs are exactly paid back to you because some of this input tariffs now some of that is get pushed now to the administration side so administration is taking a cut of that to actually allow for these import tariffs you pay it back to you these are all processes and because you're now waiting for a process for your goods to get paid back there's a delay so you're paying your input tariffs immediately on the intermediate good then you're trying to claim this back and unfortunately the process to claim them back takes some of the money and on another hand you are now waiting for them to process everything to get back your money so there's a delay in that sense and a lot of people are also making false claims on that. So these are the issues with duty drawbacks. But in essence, you need to understand what a duty drawback is. It is claiming back your import tax or your import tariff on your intermediate good or your, on your input good that you are using for your final product. And there's also another problem with this. For some reason, these import tariffs would affect smaller businesses a bit more. So duty drawbacks is probably not as best for small and medium enterprises. Especially if they're a small company and they need all this money and that and it's taking a long process for them to get back this money. They can't survive for indefinitely uh, uh, for this good for the tariffs to get paid back for them. Then we move on something called temporary admissions or duty suspension. So effectively what this means is you are not paying the import tariff and then getting back your money at the later stage. What you are doing now is when you import the good, you're immediately you're importing the good without the tariff on. So in that way, it's more effective. There's no money getting paid back um, to you at a later stage. Everything is reflective exactly of what the cost of the good is. So that is the nice part about it. So with no payments and all those involved, it makes life easier. But for the company, what they need to do is now they need to show effectively all the documents related to import goods and that. Need to project 
all your potential exports and that. So they need to have a lot of documents and that in place for this good and that to prove that they need this temporary admission and that or this duty suspension and that. And in the processes where government or all the regulations in place or all the administration in place is weak, meaning um, there's not a lot of a lot of checkups or, or this country is being real about what they're doing. In those cases and that, then what happens is a lot of these import goods don't land up into this final product and they land up somewhere else in the market and that. And this is what you're trying to uh, avoid. The idea of giving the suspension was for this final good, not for landing up somewhere else in the economy and that. So when looking at this and the, uh, and the statistics and that, you'll find that even though they had drawbacks in temporary uh, admissions, these things didn't achieve what they were expected to achieve. And we find that a lot of time, even allowing for these import um, removals at a certain stage, whether it's immediately or a later stage when it gets paid back, we find this has not been very effective for sub-Saharan. So they're probably in this case, there was a lot of uh, weak administration and the goods and these imported intermediate goods ended up in the market elsewhere now. So there are requirements for 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 duty drawbacks and temporary admission. Um, it must not be offset by other duties of your trading partners. So that's the first thing you need to take into consideration. So what you want is that it's no use you get these intermediate goods very cheap and it allows you to then produce the good more cheaper and then sell for cheaper but then you have your partners your partners that trade with you and that and then they start imposing high import tariffs firstly on when they get this good from you and then they sell it to another country or against you in a way that it prevents you from selling the good and that so you don't want that to exist in that. So those are things that need to be looked at. Secondly, anything where you're getting paid back your money on the import tariff for the duty drawbacks, the amount of money that you get paid back must not be more than what the actual tariff is. Because then it's going to be considered an export subsidy. And then that goes counter to what the, the whole idea of what the duty drawback is. And then also the other the idea is anything on capital goods, duty drawbacks also anything related to capital goods the no duty drawbacks are allowed on capital goods because they are also treated as export subsidies and that so the whole thing is that you need to set in place some system that handles these input goods especially when it comes to any complaints that might come forth when these excess rebates on levies and that so you must probably keep a lot of documentation on this thing so no one can claim that um, there's that your country has been abusing the system and that. So then we have export processing zones. I'm not going to really look at that. So they're just looking at it's the old duty drawback and the old temporary admissions and that duty suspension, but just between at in certain regions and that allowing that. So what you might find that within South Africa, there is no duty drawbacks maybe for the Eastern Cape and that. So that's a specific region where you're allowing this alleviation of uh, import tariff and that. And then lastly, trade finance, which is the issues that most low income countries face at. So having loans in that, to be provided to these low-income countries for their firms and that that is one of the major issues that I have is they not have access to any money to help them trade in that and this should be provided by the private sector but unfortunately when a private sector doesn't believe that the economy is gonna really do well or this company's gonna do really well then they take a step back sometimes then in that case is you need government to intervene and provide some assurances in that and on the other hand, also, it could come uh, that the 
that this private sector is not stepping in because maybe it's a weak financial sector and it's also then maybe very difficult to access whether um, to assess not access to assess whether these companies are really credit worthy enough so if you don't know what you aiding because i mean with a loan that you need to ensure that your money is coming back so the private sector doesn't want to jump in because they can't say whether this company is really good or not so that is the whole idea that government needs to come here and promote and help and especially for small firms which have less reputation of knowing what's going on they need to come in and help and then the ways they can do this is through revolving funds um, and they can also aid through pre-shipment export finance guarantees so this is saying we will guarantee to ensure in case there's no payment uh, that occurs to foreign firms and yeah so they need to step in and say and this is a big thing because a small firm you find sometimes things get tight and then they do not even pay these foreign firms and that's a company stepping in and then maybe finding other conditional and matching contributions for the finance and that Anyways, you can read up a bit more on the revolving funds and that. So the whole idea is that you need to pick up from this is that trade finance is a big issue, especially for low-income countries and developing countries and that. So that's the end of industrial policy to a degree. Um, yes, the only section I skipped over here was TPOs, but that's okay. That's not so important. And the next time you hear from me, we will probably be doing trade policy and that.